There we go. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for a kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to our French colleagues who are hosting us so well. Uh, you should be really proud of this meeting. I think it's an enormous success and an incredible feat. And I'm humbled to be here, uh, to be honest, to speak in front of you and to follow such a, a high bar that has been set in most of, of this conference. So I'll try to do, uh, to do my best. Uh, I'll start, what, what I wanna do here is, and I've been kind of uh, going over several panels and discussing, and we have a feeling at this day of the meeting that almost everything has been said, right? Uh, what I wanna do is reflect a little bit on the advances that we have done, how far we have come on addressing many, many of these issues. I uh, put that in the context of the situation, the global situation that we are uh, nowadays. And in doing so, what I try to do is to look ahead and try to bring forward those wicked problems that we have to face during the next 20 years to sustain the advances that we have done and to face new advances that where we have not addressed. And I'll try to do both to call attention to some of those advances and to bring those that have been in the shadows of the spotlight uh, and have not, I think, received the attention that uh, it deserves for the role it has in shaping our landscapes. This is an image of the world that we live in. It's a moving target. Uh, we live in a time of accelerated change, and we live in a time of high connectivity. And what are the implications of that? So on the one hand, you have improving conditions on the one side, if I had time to explain those graphs on the left, and you have pressures mounting on the other side. As an academic, when you try to understand these changes, and in a region where I work, the Amazon, you are always reflecting on what we understand is overwhelmed by the changes that take place. So the analytical tools that we have, the solutions that we have, is suddenly overwhelmed by the changes that happen around them. And we're very badly equipped as scholars and practitioners to cope with complexity and accelerated change. And I want to get to the ground, to the Amazon, to reflect on issues that I think speak to many other regions. I think the Amazon is not only a keystone region for the global environment, but it's an emblematic region of the development problems that we have in many places. And while the, the, the lessons that we get from regions like that, I think will help us to reflect on problems that, that we have uh, elsewhere. So I want to look at the shadows of the spotlight here and look at some of the underlying social processes that are there. The governance issues that are related to our property rights. How our property rights have evolved to deal with complex and connected landscapes or not. Uh, the nature of collective action. How ourselves as communities have been able to cope and to move beyond our territorial thinking and our local thinking into cope with connections and issues that affect us from the distance. And finally, what I think is the elephant in the room and the least addressed issues in a context like this, which is the urban issues, both from the perspective of vulnerability to climate change and on the perspective of how it shapes the landscapes in the regions where we work. I don't think we have given enough attention to the connections and, and importance of urban air to that. Here's an example of areas where we, we advanced in many ways. I think during the past 20 years in the Amazon is emblematic of that, we have been able to cope with the expansion of agricultural frontiers by creating a variety of institutional arrangements that protect the rights of local populations and serve as a buffer to deforestation. It's an enormous advance in a region like the Amazon in few years 40% of the region has been set aside or in some form of arrangement that address those issues. That approach has a limitation. And we see the limitation now very clearly. I'm calling it islands of landscape governance. What indigenous peoples and local communities have been successfully addressing the boundaries of their reserves to buffer the pressure from the outside when possible. Those governance arrangements that function well at one level 
are not enough to deal with problems that come from the outside. Pollutions come through watersheds. Smoke comes through the air. Pressures come through the borders. We need to think about moving to a multi-level governance that put those areas in the context of changing landscapes. So not to lose the advances we have made so much in the previous years, we need to move in and move a step ahead to address the pressures that we now face in this context. You can look at another region in Brazil where we have is a coevolution of many kinds of property regimes next to each other and overlapping with each other. Those property regimes have evolved to function well with particular types of resources, but they do not address flows. They do not address other kinds of commons that are related to ecosystem services. So you see the pressures from the outside. And those pressures reflect not only economic pressures, but they reflect the way people get attached and are attached to landscapes. For indigenous peoples who have a landscape within, that is part of their identity, that is part of the way of life. For people who want to get the primary productivity out of the landscape above. And for the humongous pressures of mining that has a landscape below. Those property regimes are now challenged to find cross-border governance, to find ways and commitments in which we have a common contract to deal with the problems that transcend the boundaries that we are able to govern so well. People are reacting. In enforcement, in, in first person enforcement, as the news from the Washington Post shows recently, which is not a new issue in the Amazon, but is becoming a more pressing issue of the Amazon of protecting your borders with guns. And you have other examples where people have been proactive in trying to reach out and find other forms of collective action in social capital that address those connectivities that we now face. But you have on the other side an elephant in the room. The Amazon is an urban region. Urban networks and urban growth are shaping the landscape today, are shaping the flow of people, and will shape the landscape in the next 20 years. It's the flow and connections, physical, social, economic, and cultural that will define the Amazon and many other parts of the world in the years to come. The face of urban conditions in the Amazon is the face of climate change vulnerability that we have not addressed enough. In this region, which is the Amazon estuary, the vast majority of the population there, and that accounts for about a million and a half to two million people, live in conditions of vulnerability to flood, vulnerability to violence, not to say, uh, lack of sewage, uh, lack of, of uh, good water, that impact not only them, but impact upstreams and downstreams. And that's the situation that we need to face. We cannot uh, treat landscapes as isolated, that urban reality in which people move between those landscapes. And that uh, really, the mass of the vulnerability to climate change are, con are concentrated. That creates different dimensions for collective action. And here you have a situation where you have the fishermen on the right, who until not long ago had a collective action problem to deal with other fishermen. It was a problem of dealing with the technology of fishing, a problem of dealing with how much we should catch. That same fisherman is now subsumed under a condition of pollution and a condition of urban sprawl, a condition that is much beyond the collective action mechanisms and the form uh, of agreements that, that we have uh, learned to do. So the same social norms, the same rules that we develop at a local scale between people that are more or less similar with similar goals are not enough to capture the problems that come from the outside. They're basically subsumed under conditions that have no power to change. The people who, had, who use the water and depend deeply on the water uh, and used to know where to go for a bath, used to know which tide 
would clean the surroundings so you could use the water, are now confronted with urban pollution, both solid and, and organic, and confronted with industrial spills like the one on the bottom of Kauli, which had become, become a common occurrence in this part of the Amazon. They are part of a landscape. It's a landscape largely defined by urban areas. But most of, although there's all these accelerated changes, most of our social institutions, most of our forms of collective actions is still work at a small territorial level. It's a different challenge, cognitive and this of social interaction. To conclude, or to get to conclude in just this few minutes, we should make no mistake. Landscapes in the next 20 years will be shaped by the coevolution of urban areas, agrarian systems, and all these kinds of reserves. And we need to develop different kinds of thinking. We need to develop complex system perspectives to cope with a world in accelerated change and understand the implications of the solutions that we put that sometimes create structures that are not adaptable to new realities. So just some final remarks and maybe we'll pick on some of, the, of those issues as we, as we sit for a discussion. We have made advances in governance systems to protect many of our territories. We need to think in a landscape way about bridging institutions, to put emphasis in ways of bridging, not of separating landscapes. I think the question of funding of climate change that comes so often here, to me, is less of a question of where it's coming from, but more of a question of where is it going? What are the priorities? that will allow us to apply those funds in a way that make an impact, that make a difference, and that make an incremental improvement over time. A region like the Amazon, you hear all the time that, oh, we had that before. You know, we had that incredible plan before, and they were abandoned. It's incremental changes that will make a difference in the life of people. And how we apply those funds, and where we apply those funds, will help us to set a process of continuous adaptation to change instead of uh, 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 a static perspective that we think we're going to solve our problems. And we have an enormous role in that as academics, as practitioners, to rethink the limits of our conceptual approaches, rethinking the limits of our analytical frameworks to actually cope with the complexity of problems that our concepts and our disciplines are handicapped to do. And with that, I'll leave it to Robin to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And I think Eduardo took us straight to the heart of what for me is perhaps the single biggest problem, this whole, whole question of realigning our institutions to deal with the issues. And there's been no collusion between us, but his, Eduardo's remarks about cities in the Amazon reflect exactly my observations on the cities of Southeast Asia, that if you want to understand the future scenarios for the forests, you have to understand what's going to happen in the urban environment. There are very close interactions there. Anyway, the next speaker is Robert, Robin Chasden. Um, she's going to talk about restoration. Now, we keep hearing throughout this meeting that there are vast areas of degraded land throughout the world. There have been inventories of land that might be forested. This is seen as having a, a huge role to play in establishing the landscapes of the future, what they're going to look like, how much carbon they're going to hold. So I would like to invite Robin to... Hmm, I was hoping to get your power... Oh, there we go, yes. Get you off to a good start. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much, and... Uh, <laughs> And it's really a tremendous honor for me to, to be here today and uh, to talk to my colleagues both here and elsewhere. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of discussions of partnerships during the meeting and a lot of discussions of leveraging. And I'm going to be using those terms but in a slightly different way. As many of you know, um, in the first part of this century, most of the deforestation that we've documented in the world has occurred in the tropics. And this is 
uh, creating a very uh, urgent crisis for biodiversity, for forest dependent peoples, and for all the ecosystem services that those forests uh, were producing. But we also know, and we're learning more every day, that after forests are destroyed, they have a very high potential to regrow and to, uh, they have a very high intrinsic resilience in many situations. And this is going to be the focus of my, my talk today because I feel that this aspect of what nature can provide for us has really been neglected in the whole restoration agenda. Many of us in the room have been feeling that uh, we can no longer just rely on protecting existing forests and stopping deforestation and reducing forest degradation, that this is not enough and that we need to go further and take a lot more steps. And what are those steps? Well, I'd like to suggest that those steps can really depend very much on regrowing forests and rebuilding landscapes, but in a way that we are working together with nature in a partnership. So this is the new partnership. And what you see in this picture is an area of northeastern Costa Rica on a very large farm uh, that has three different stages of second growth, all on former pastures. And it is an amazing place to walk through and to witness what has happened with spontaneous natural regeneration. You can also see, uh, if you look carefully, a few uh, pine trees and cypress trees that were in former plantations on the property. Forests know how to regrow. They have uh, evolved to do this, and uh, the species that make up the early successional stages of forests are the best experts in the world at colonizing open areas, colonizing even degraded land. Um, and in many cases, we don't really need to even put anything there. We just need to let those species come in and do what they've been doing for billions of years. But in many cases, forests need our help to be able to do this, to even be able to undergo natural regeneration without um, our own planting. But they still need our help in many ways, and that's what I want to focus on. There are examples out there where forests have regrown at very large scales without any planting. Uh, this example, many of you know, it's from northwestern Costa Rica. And this area had been uh, undergoing gradual deforestation for over a century and reached a, a fairly low level of about 23% forest cover in the 1960s and 1970s, got even lower than that. And then due to a variety of uh, events external to Costa Rica largely, a drop in beef prices primarily, marginal uh, farmers abandoned their, their pastures and those pastures began growing back on their own. And by 2005, the forest cover in this region doubled, again without any tree planting. In fact, nobody really planned this at all. Another example, a uh, slightly smaller scale, but still uh, a fairly impressive documentation of natural regeneration that was recently published um, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in this one municipality. Over a 36 year period, forest cover increased on its own, 15%. Uh, and an estimate of what that would have cost if active restoration had been applied uh, came to $15 million. So this is what I mean, that we can really uh, partner with nature um, to take care of this job in many situations without having to spend the kind of money uh, to plant trees and do other kinds of active restoration measures. So I want to look back a little bit at how we have, uh, how the science policy questions have changed largely in my own professional career, even just since the last 10 years. Um, the first one focuses on, this was, has been a big concern with the science policy interface, how much do we need to conserve in terms of primary forest? 
in order to sustain biodiversity? So what's, what's the threshold for that? Conservation biologists have wrestled with this for a long time. But now we're asking somewhat different questions. Now we're asking how many little bits of biodiversity do we need to keep in a, a landscape? How much native vegetation, little bits and pieces of it, do we need uh, to regenerate forest in that region? The second question that's changed a lot is sort of the big red issue. How can we prevent forest degradation and deforestation due to mostly logging and shifting cultivation? And this question has sort of changed to focus more on how can we improve the livelihoods of forest-based communities and promote local governance um, as Eduardo was discussing, while at the same time allowing forests to regenerate and be restored. And third, for many years there's been this uh, land sparing question of how can we minimize the conversion of forest in order to accommodate agriculture and what kinds of agriculture can we fit uh, with a minimum amount of deforestation. And now we're asking this question. How can we spare agricultural land to regrow forests? So there's a lot of questions that have sort of become flipped around um, in our focus on restoration, and it really begs a whole new research agenda. Um, now when you drive around many areas of Brazil, you, you can see these billboards. Um, this billboard actually was advertising a phone number for who to call to post your ad on the billboard. But uh, with a little photoshopping, <laughs> now we've, um, we've announced that this pasture is available for restoration. So what does it take to regrow a landscape? What does this partnership mean? Well, it really means understanding and utilizing and valuing all the little bits and pieces of native biodiversity that are still out there. And in some cases, they're, they're quite apparent. In this landscape, there's a lot of uh, remnant vegetation, a lot of uh, shrubs that are already starting to regrow. And you can tell what would happen here if you just removed the cattle within a few years, you'd have a sea of trees without any, tr any tree planting. So you could say that this landscape has a very high degree of ecological memory. There are many elements in the landscape that connect the regenerating forests with the former forests. So it's a way of linking the native biodiversity that has been living in the landscape with how that can be shaped in the future. And we need the animals to help us to do this. And this is why fauna and conservation of fauna is extremely important. And it, it's been little mentioned at this conference. But really, without the animals that disperse seeds and that regulate populations of seedlings, we won't be able to get uh, forest regrowing in the landscape. And large uh, mobile birds are really important for moving seeds around the landscape and for creating new patches of vegetation when there is um, any kind of abandoned land or open land. And this is um, keel-billed toucan from Costa Rica. Um, after a couple of hours of observation on this myconia tree, 18 different species of frugivores were observed. Um, this is the collared arasari, a smaller bodied toucan. Um, the toucans are amazing because they eat both small fruits and large seeded fruits as well. And they are very important dispersers of canopy palms and other species such as this virola tree, um, wild nutmeg. And without these species present in the landscape, these trees are really not going to be able to move around and colonize new areas. But fortunately, we are seeing these species cropping up in all of the forest areas that we're studying um, in this region of Costa Rica. So the birds are really doing a phenomenal job of planting trees. Not only that, but the trees that the toucans plant are the same species that the spider monkey eats, and this is an endangered primate um, in throughout Central America. So we can now rely on the services of these dispersal agents to also support populations of endangered species, of mammals, bats. Um, many, many different frugivores rely on these palms for their food supply. 
Another part of the ecological memory um, is the human component of it. That's not just the memory of the species of plants and animals, non-human animals, but it's also the, the cultural memory and the cultural knowledge, indigenous knowledge that has developed over many generations about how to manage forests because these civilizations relied upon the regenerative capacity of the forest in order to, to make their living. It was their life. And they know that if there are different amounts of uh, fertility of the soil, that you have to wait longer after you clear uh, to re-clear that area for your cropping cycle. So this whole indigenous shifting cultivation cycle, uh, which has developed independently in all tropical regions of the world, is a source of cultural memory and one that we need to, I think, resurrect in many of our landscapes to be able to have all kinds of different stages of succession and to be able to still have some productive land. These components that we call ecological memory and the knowledge that the cultural memory are both legacies um, and drivers of the change. So it's a dynamical system where um, as forests change, uh, those changes are being driven by the remnants that were present initially, but then those remnants um, are legacies of the prior land use. So by managing landscapes now or in the past, we are affecting the way those landscapes are going to be resilient in the future. And this is the, where the, the memory comes in, that we're really, what we do now, what we did 20 years ago, what people did 200 years ago, still has an imprint on the landscape. And thinking about how we can modify our actions now, thinking in an anticipatory way about how this is going to affect the resilience of the landscape. Um, there's a wide gradient in terms of the extent of human modifications in landscapes. There are some landscapes that have, are still relatively pristine, still have expanses of forest with relatively little human uh, disturbance or forest loss. Those would be um, here on the lower left part of this diagram. Um, and then the spectrum goes all the way to the right to a very highly modified, almost completely humanized landscape. Both the rate of, of succession, the rate of forest regrowth, or spontaneous regrowth that would happen in this landscape uh, is very much affected by that level of human modification so that that level goes down uh, with increasing human disturbance, at the same time, the predictability doesn't quite behave that way. And I think we need, this is important to understand how we can harness natural regeneration because um, it's much more predictable when you have either very little disturbance or where you have a lot of disturbance. And in the in-between situation is where you can get many different multiple pathways because of the heterogeneity of the system. So we've seen the high potential for large-scale natural regeneration. This has been demonstrated in many different parts of the world. But how do we make this happen and where do we make this happen? And one tool that we can use is to try to understand how much regenerating forest there is out there. The, this is an attempt to do that using wall-to-wall um, -wall imagery uh, that's estimating biomass. And what you see in this map, all of the lighter, the red and yellow shades are forest areas that had a biomass equivalent to a 20-year-old secondary forest or less in the year 2008 when this um, imagery was available. And when you mask out the, for the other sorts of forest and other non-forest ecosystems, this is what you can see. There's a huge, huge amount at least in 2008, there was a huge amount of uh, regrowing forest within the lowland American tropics. And this forest carries a huge potential for carbon mitigation if it's allowed to continue growing. Um, we can also see incredible in complexity, spatial complexity uh, within landscapes. And this is important to incorporate in, in conservation in terms of how can we target 
uh, reforestation in order to provide co continuity connectivity. I mean connectivity in a slightly different way than Eduardo used it. Uh, ways in which the landscape can allow the movement of animals um, in a type of a corridor. And you can see this is the landscape where I work in northeastern Costa Rica. We have all kinds of different land uses. We have tree plantations, banana, and encroaching pineapple plantations. And what you can do with a knowledge of uh, how birds move through the landscape, um, you can actually um, look at where are the bottlenecks for the movement and where would the priority areas be for reestablishing natural forest cover so that we can um, make this landscape much more hospitable and we're more likely to avoid extinction debt in this landscape if the animals can move around and find habitats. There's still a lot of forest in this landscape, but we need to plan where the new connections are made in a much more scientific way. And finally, there are ways of, of rewarding landowners for protecting natural regeneration through payments for environmental services. And on this beautiful farm that I showed earlier, uh, they have 90 hectares that are now enrolled in uh, the Environmental Service Payments Program in Costa Rica just to let it grow back. And uh, this was very encouraging for me to see. So when I mentioned leverage before, um, I mean this in the sense that using the power of nature and uh, harnessing the power of nature to really move forward large-scale restoration in a way that we have not done before and, and really um, moving, uh, helping, uh, using nature to help us to bring nature back. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robin. And um, I, th I think indeed we are on the cusp of a huge uh, opportunity to expand the areas of forests in the world. Between 2010 and 2015, if you believe the FAO Forest Resources Assessment, 16 countries moved from being net losers of forests to being places where forests were increasing in extent. And now there are more countries in the world where forests are expanding than where forests are declining. But of course, we need to be sure that those forests are going to be of a sort that's going to provide all the biodiversity and the environmental benefits that were provided by the forests that came before. So, um, comes to our penultimate speaker, Thelma Krug, who uh, is going to give us the perspectives from her position on the IPCC and her knowledge from the UNFCCC processes. I learned. Uh, just today or a few days ago, that of the 150 um, development um, commitments that were submitted by countries uh, for the meetings here in Paris, only seven even mentioned the word landscape. So I think the people in this room are a self-selected bunch of people who believe in this landscape stuff. But maybe Thelma can tell us why that is. <laughs> It's an enormous pleasure for me to be here. It's really an honor. And I would like to thank the organizers and you, Jeff, for also helping us to coordinate this session. For those of you who know me, um, uh, know that I'm very indisciplined in terms of time. And now I'm uh, wearing a different hat, which is putting a, an additional burden on me, in a good sense. Uh, because I, uh, I am uh, referring to talk uh, as IPCC vice chair. So I have a very little, little degree of freedom to talk about too many other things. And this is why my presentation is a little bit different from the previous one, ones. I was very happy to see that both of them address Brazil and I wouldn't have done as well as they did as Brazilian. And, um, and uh, th what I'm going to uh, present, as a matter of fact, difficult for me because I'm going to have to read through, uh, is a compilation of 15 kilograms of literature that was produced by the IPCC in its last assessment report, which was carried out uh, uh, in 2013 and 2014. So I tried to pull out of these 15 kilograms this pile, um, elements that I thought 
um, I could bring here uh, in a more general way. The title I was provided was Local Knowledge for Climate and Development Goals, but obviously I think I'm going to go through different ways of introducing this as well. So, um, since my hat, as I said here, is as IPCC, I will limit my considerations here to the findings of the IPCC. So, uh, one of the high confidence messages from the mitigation working group of the IPCC. IPCC works with three uh, working groups in its structure. Uh, there is the physical science basis of climate change as group one, and then group two works with vulnerabilities, adaptation, uh, and impacts. And finally, working group three uh, works with mitigation. So I tried to pull, as I said, from these three, um, my presentation here, which uh, is limited to seven minutes. And uh, on the backgrounds, Jeff gave me one minute more. <laughs> so I'll try to do that. So one of the high confidence, again, let me stop here, IPCC doesn't carry out research, so it pulls together the scientific knowledge, up-to-date scientific knowledge, normally from peer-reviewed literature. Um, it tries to uh, put together different views as well, um, and also assigns as much as it can probabilities or uncertainty uh, qualitative assessments. So when it has high confidence, it's one measure of the uncertainty linked, which in this case is not uh, very low. It says one of the high confidence messages from the mitigation working group is that the effects of climate change added to other stresses, such as poverty, inequality, or diseases, will make sustainable development objectives, such as food and livelihood security, poverty reduction, health, and access to clean water, more difficult to achieve for many locations, systems, and affected population. In terms of what to do to address climate change and threats to development now and in the future, transformation changes are likely to be required for climate re resilient pathways, that is, development trajectories that combine adaptation and mitigation with effective institutions to realize the goal of sustainable development. The IPCC in the last assessment described four different pathways of emissions, including one that is representative of a scenario that aims to keep global warming below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels until the end of this century. A level that was agreed by the negotiators and is normally referred to as their long-term target. So moving to this pathway, in, we required, uh, moving to this pathway, we require substantial reductions in emissions in all sectors, as well as adaptation to avoid or minimize the risks of climate change. Scenarios from integrated models suggest the possibility of very different land landscapes relative to today, mitigation inducing greater land cover conversion than in the baseline scenarios. So the implementation of policies and measures aligned to development and climate objectives can deliver substantial co-benefits and help avoid climate risks in developing countries. Moderating the impacts of climate change will require a strong foundation in science and technology, but the deployment of science and relevant technologies need effective institutional arrangements to bolster both adaptation and mitigation demands and to combine technology with local knowledge. 
The role of adaptation, in addition to mitigation, is a crucial one. Since the maximum two degrees rise in temperature poses risks for people, assets, economies, and ecosystems caused by heat stress, extreme precipitation, inland and coastal flooding, landslides, air pollution drought, air pollution drought, and water scarcity. The indigenous, local, and traditional knowledge systems and practices have not been used consistently in existing adaptation efforts. But if so, could increase the effectiveness of adaptation. IPCC also acknowledges that the salience of indigenous, local, and traditional knowledge will be challenged by climate change impacts. Projected changes beyond historical conditions could reduce the reliance on indigenous knowledge affecting the adaptive capacity of a number of peoples globally. There are several examples of local knowledge applied to climate change adaptation. Normally, local knowledge-based adaptation is focused primarily on the use of traditional knowledge to increase adaptive capacity at the community level. Specific example that I could provide here is for PJ, where adaptive ecological knowledge was applied when de developing the adaptive action related to water supply in addition to enhancing community awareness. One of the major determinants of popular support for climate policy is whether people have an underlying belief that climate change is dangerous. This concern can be influenced by both cultural factors and the methods of communication. Where a combination of top-down and bottom-up activities have been undertaken, the links between adaptation planning and implementation have been strengthened. So in addition to adaptation measures, limiting warming to the two degrees centigrades will require substantial emission reductions, as I said, over the next few decades. Which mitigation activities are available or incentivized has important implications on land conversion. For instance, the payment upon results for Red Plus may stimulate the implementation of several forest-related mitigation activities. And there are studies about their effect on livelihoods and poverty and food and energy security, but experience so far is inadequate to permit generalizations in these regards. In the majority of low concentration scenarios, the share of low carbon electricity supply comprising renewable energy, nuclear, carbon storage and cap uh, carbon capture and storage, including bioenergy with CO2 carbon and storage, increases from the current sh share of approximately 30% to more than 80% by 2050. Assessment of energy technology options will need to include impacts on landscapes, ecological and social dimensions on accounting for multiple values and on, and on energy distribution and access. The scenarios also suggest a possibly essential role of, for land. The key sources associated with mitigation being related to the demand for bioenergy, the demand to store carbon in land by reducing deforestation, encouraging afforestation and altering soil management practices, and also reductions from known CO2 greenhouse gas emissions by changing management practices. All of these may imply in significant changes in landscapes. Because integrating climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, and sustainable development is a relatively new challenge, research should be a very high priority to inform strategies and actions. 
the most salient research need is to improve the understanding of how climate change mitigation and adaptation can be combined with resilient, sustainable development pathways in a wide variety of regional and sectoral contexts. As important, research to improve the understanding of how to build social inclusiveness into climate change response and on issues of social values, climate justice, participation, and how to interact with deployment of mitigation, adaptation interventions, and sustainable development policies in different regions and social policy, political context. So I hope I have brought, as I said, a general vision of, uh, of, how, of the importance of local knowledge, indigenous knowledge as well. And uh, with this, Jeff, I complete my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You. Kept you. So I'm going to sit down now and ask my panelists some questions. In fact, I might even ask the same question to all three of them because they might have quite different answers. But starting with Eduardo, you've listened to what uh, Robin told us was possible. and You've listened to what Thelma told us we've all agreed we'd like to do. I mean, to what extent does this really require a, a reinvention of the sorts of institutions that deal with rural land use? Are the ones that we've got now, were they designed before these problems came along? Are they fit for purpose? <laughs> That's the easy question. <laughs> See, reinvention is, is a strong word. I'll start there. I mean, it's hard to talk about institution without talking about context. So I don't think there's magic bullets for institutions if you don't understand the history of a, of a particular place. And, and that's a key element, that just recognizing that institutions have evolved along with the interactions of peoples and policies and conflicts uh, in itself uh, situates ways of thinking about it and solutions that are applicable and realistic to a particular situation. So I think that would be the first, the first issue to consider, that we cannot look for solutions in institutional arrangements that separate that from the history of given landscapes. And the history and the way customary rights and other uh, forms of institutional arrangements uh, at a local level uh, have evolved. Now that said, I think uh, most of the institutions that have evolved over time to deal with problems that are localized do not fit the problems that we have now. So I said, we need to think about what uh, uh, Orion called institutional fit and the way institutions are um, uh, arranged in terms of the ecological processes of the landscapes. And we need to think about institutional interplay, how institutions relate to each other over time. So on the one hand, I think we need to build upon the institutions that we find and that you know, have a history in different places. And on the other hand, confront the fact that they are not enough to deal with problems that have evolved um, uh, outside of their context. Mm. Very so, short answer. Robin, uh, are these sorts of sectoral barriers things that are uh, making it harder for restoration and reforestation to exist? Is that one of the problems you face? That's a really big problem. I think the, there, there is an important role for the sectorial institutions that we have, but I don't think they're going to be, they're not coping with um, the solutions to the problems. In fact, they're in many cases exacerbating some of the problems uh, because they don't have the broad enough vision, they don't have uh, the broad stakeholder base that's needed to really bring some of these large scale transformations. So I do think we really need to invent some new ways of building institutions that from the very onset are multi-sectorial in their goals. And that there are common goals that all of these, that agriculture, that forestry, that um, education, um, police, all of the, they, they all have very common goals and it's about time that we build institutions around those common goals. Thanks, so Thelma, you said that the IPCC doesn't really approve of landscapes, but everything you said 
sounds as though it would require things to happen at that landscape scale. So speaking off the record as a <laughs> private oh. citizen. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to, if you allow me, Jeff, I will catch up also in the previous questions, if I may. So I do think that, you know, we, are, uh, we, need, we need, obviously, transformation, and obviously the way that uh, we should be moving it would be to what IPCC would say, which is a climate-resilient pathway. So that's bringing adaptation, mitigation together. Does that require, uh, you know, a, a transformation also to the institutions? I think it, 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 it very much uh, uh, it's very much different from region to region. So you have very different capacities uh, uh, and institutions working in, in each region, in each country, more specifically. So one thing that I find uh, uh, interesting is that when you're talking about mitigation, mitigation has, uh, uh, and in particular when you're thinking of, of uh, a, 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 an enormous amount of changes that you have to introduce, introduce for the introduction of renewables, and this might be hydros, this might be eolic, this might be geothermal, this might be solar. So all these may need to fit into the landscape and may affect people in different ways because some people are very uncomfortable, uh, uh, feel very uncomfortable with, for instance, the noise of the eolic, the vision of the solar panels in large scale. So all these things are very difficult. And uh, so I, in adaptation is even, even more complicated because you are going then in local level, in the local needs for adaptation. We require more than the existing institutions that we have, but we necessarily need to engage the local communities. I don't see things moving and being implemented without a real strong participation of, um, of the communities, of the local people, and the embedment of their knowledge into whatever adaptation uh, measure is being uh, thought to be implemented. So I do see as a, a real uh, transformation of the world and I now on a more positive tone and I say that if there is an agreement here in Paris, this is the seed for a world that's going to be completely different until the end of this century. We don't have to wait until that because you need to have measures being implemented acutely, enormous amount of uh, 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 measures that need to be taken, and that in my vision is gonna, is gonna uh, demonstrate to have uh, an enormous impact in the landscapes, the way we have them today, in the management that we apply today. But as I said, this is going to be very diverse in, in different levels, time-wise, in different regions of the world. So that is my, um, I think it's a transformation in all aspects, institutional-wise including. So, your question now got lost <laughs> into my, yeah. No, I think you've. Yeah, okay, covered <laughs> all this. Yes, okay, okay. No, okay, my next question though would be, you all work in research institutes and you all teach, um, are we, giving people the skills and competences they need to deal with these complex situations? And do we have the research capacity, and probably we obviously do in some places, but in general, do we have the research capacity to track all these systems and the way they're changing and to learn from what's happening and have sort of feedback and, and so forth so we can adapt as we go along? Maybe that's one for Robin first. Huh? Academic institutions are, are not very nimble. <laughs> they tend to like their traditions and they like their silos, their disciplinary silos. So I think the salvation is in those programs that are interdisciplinary and there's a growing number and this is a, a, a big trend in higher education. Um, but having tried to make changes within my own institution, I can tell you it's, there's a lot of resistance to breaking down those barriers and providing students with a really cross-disciplinary education and, and problem-solving uh, situations, especially at the graduate level where they're, where they're developing their research. Um, 
As far as the, the capacity, I do think we have a huge amount of capacity out there that is not being channeled um, effectively uh, to into the policy arena and into the more implementation issues that, that are being faced. I think that there's a huge need for more links between uh, the academic institutions and the policy world. And it's hard to do, and, and the goals and language are different, and the, the interest in details is very different, but I, I think there's a huge potential that's untapped, and it doesn't necessarily involve a lot of new training. This is an excellent answer. I think it covers most of, of the issues, so, uh, so perhaps I'll bring uh, some other elements to it. I think when I see a, a, a crowd like this, and when I visit, uh, sessions here, I see that happening. I see that we, we are sort of bringing together the expertise to address, uh, you know, problem-oriented issues that force us beyond our disciplinary comfort zones and, and needs. What I think and I find more productive when I, I talk to my students is that not to think about disciplines, think about expertise. And there's a place of expertise in everything, a deep expertise. And I find myself, you know, wearing my disciplinary hat in some context, my interdisciplinary hat in another context, my transdisciplinary hat in another context. But what, what I think matters is, you know, what expertise do you bring to a larger question? And if we think that way, and if we think about asking questions differently, we find a role for disciplines, we find a role for expertise, we find a role for everybody to contribute in a meaningful way to questions that are, are beyond our own limits and add to uh, answer to the problems that we have. Yeah, I have it here. So trying to add on top of um, what has been said, well, obviously there is a lot of uh, research done, a lot due to be done. So if you look in the 15 kilograms, IPCC with a lot of chapters in the three working group groups. You are going to find at the end of each one a session devoted to research needs and gaps. So there is still a lot to be done and possibly in a different way. To be much more integrative, as I said in my last questions, you know, how to look at things, not, you know, as, as, as a, a if, uh, as in a focus, but in a broader context, which I think is, is important. But also I think, um, Jeff, that as per the IPCC, and we recognize that we don't have, we are not ashamed to, to say this, our ability to communicate is improving, but it has not got yet there to facilitate the understanding of the issues and the research findings in a way that's accessible to everybody. So when it comes to policymakers, we do try to have like the summary for policymakers instead of the 15 kilograms, you go down to maybe 500, uh, I mean, just a, uh, not, not even a kilo of information. <laughs> and even then, you find that it's very uh, difficult to be assimilated. So I think that we have to work in many different directions. And more importantly, an IPCC recognizes this when it's trying to pull the, the knowledge the, from research, from peer-reviewed literature, and opening up because of developing countries' uh, uh, lack of uh, as, as much knowledge as in developed countries. It acknowledges that there is a deficiency of information, data, and information from developing countries. That's critical. So we need to work in many, many directions to fueling gaps, and including through the, uh, through the provision of more regionalized information. Because that's what countries need. They don't need a research that don't talk to them don't talk to their area. And even if you have regional, they are going to push you to have local because that's what they are waiting for, most likely to implement uh, actions that they see are going to be more effective. Thank you very much, Toma. I think that last point is a very important one. Clearly, there are some countries that have excellent research and education capacities and others that still have some way to go. 
Now, I, I can't really see from here because the lights are shining in my eyes, but I assume that Governor Brown is present. So um, I would like <laughs> to invite you to come and, and, and talk to us. Um, I did introduce you a little bit when I started the session, so <laughs> welcome. <laughs> but. Uh, Governor Brown has had incredible impacts and has been a champion of the causes that are dear to all our hearts in a fairly large landscape, California, but we're really keen to hear what you have to say on this issue um, today. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there is a lot to say, and I think the first point would be that we tend to live in very artificial environments, built up environments that, um, without thinking about it too much, we assume are, are kind of the, is reality. And yet the natural uh, environment uh, that is underlying everything, uh, that's something that's more remote. And whether it's t tearing down forests or paving over um, raw land or agricultural land, uh, we have to get on the side of nature and the, the development uh, through the modern market system, uh, science and technology is, is incredible uh, to allow, instead of a billion people that was the norm for hundreds of years and not too many less than that for thousands of years, um, now we've got 7.2 billion people and a billion cars. It wasn't very long ago, I think about 30 years ago, when the world only had 300 million cars. So where are we going down the road here? Uh, two billion cars, maybe more than that. If we take the US, or let's take the California experience. California has about 39 million people, and we need 32 million vehicles for those 39 million people. Now, if we apply that to the 7.2 billion, we need at least, well, close to 7 billion cars, or 6.5 billion, which obviously is not, not possible. So in addition to the research and the science, uh, we do need to consider how, our, how is humankind going to fit in with the natural systems, with the atmosphere above and the soil below and all the species and the habitats that uh, support these species, uh, how do we fit in? And as the dominant um, force now, humankind, with it, all the impact that we're multiplying, um, we, we destroy and then through science and adaptation and innovation, we try to compensate. Uh, now, innovation, research, critical, but there's also uh, a rethinking of how human civilization should work and uh, certainly understanding the local. A lot of our our uh, ideas, here we are in a, in a world forum, but we all come from a specific place. And do, do people know about that place? When you go to school, uh, certainly in, in California, you do study California history for a year in the fourth grade. And then you study American history, and you may study world history, but you don't study your neighborhood history, the, the history of the land on which you live. Uh, who were the forebears? Um, what about the fauna and the flora? What, what is this particular place? So that knowledge uh, is fundamental. And going forward, we, we, our research is needed not only for new tools and new techniques and new, more gadgets and more inventions, but we also have to find uh, understandings uh, that would uh, counsel us on how to live uh, with more compatibility uh, with, with the natural systems on which we depend. And we're a long way from that. In fact, that's not even a topic uh, in, mo in most uh, places and most news stories and most uh, uh, governing activities. Uh, this business of, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks, um, had the saying, know yourself. Well, part of yourself is the intimate surroundings that you inhabit. 
And so learning how to, to really re-inhabit each place that we're a part of, and how do we do that um, in some collaborative way on a global level. Um, we look at the rainforests and their destruction, whether it's in Indonesia or Brazil, uh, but we, there's a lot of destruction everywhere. Um, and where can we reforest? And how do we, uh, how much land do we devote to parking, to cement, um, to moving around? And when you look at uh, all the cars, like in California, for example, um, the vehicle miles traveled at last count was about 300, over 330 billion miles. That's a lot of miles for uh, 39 million people. And in order to do that, of course, you need highways, you need cement. Cement is a significant contributor to greenhouse gases. And then you need a place to put the car, and then people have to get, well, there's a lot of things that go with that. So we, we have to uh, figure out new energy sources, but we also have to find new ways of living, and that's actually showing up. Uh, more people are not owning cars, uh, or they're sharing cars to these various uh, ride-sharing programs. Same thing with housing. So this um, uh, looking at the world and getting more out of less stuff. You could say, you could call it efficiency, or you could call it elegance. How do you live uh, in the world, on the, in the place where you are, in a way that takes into account all the uh, other parts uh, that make life possible? So yeah, we got the forests themselves, you burn them all down, that's, I don't know, 20% of the greenhouse gases. That's, that's big. And so that's a very important area that has nothing to do with coal or oil or gas. Uh, also, whatever the fuel is, how much do you really need? How many trips would be needed? And as a matter of fact, the number of trips in a place like California is going up, and the further, uh, the, the distance of the trips are going up. So uh, we want to make sure that when we're driving them uh, more frequently and longer, we like to do it in a zero emission vehicle. But another way to reduce emissions would be to drive less. And that's where land use comes in. And in California, we have some laws where we're, we're encouraging people to live closer uh, to where they work. And the, the uh, construction of habitats that would allow for a less destructive uh, human community. That, that's, that's also very important, not very easy. Uh, aligning land use with the environment is difficult because the cheapest land is usually the furthest land away. So if you go to a, what they call a green field, it's a lot easier to build. If you wanna to go to an existing place, well, there's already a character of an existing urban space. And whenever you try to alter the character, the neighbors say, well, you, you know, you're, you're changing our neighborhood. We don't like that. And so building where people are with greater density and greater elegance, I would hope, um, is very challenging. Sprawl trumps urban uh, density every time, unless the laws, the taxes, the regulations can be readjusted. So that's a whole nother area besides renewable energy or zero emission cars or public transit. There's just how we, uh, how we design our, our, our communities and uh, where you have to live. Now, if you live in a place like San Francisco, the rents are going through the roof. So therefore, people want to live 30 miles away, 50 miles away, 75 miles away, and then you have to drive every day. I think some huge percentage of people uh, drive by themselves. I don't know whether it's 85 percent, 90 percent, but it's a very big number. So just in redesigning how we all show up every day is a major contributor to uh, reducing greenhouse gases, to uh, protecting habitat, and reducing the onslaught 
on uh, species diversity. So we're on a track um, of destruction. In fact, I don't know how many of you people remember the song, Time of, is it Day of Destruction? Time for Barry McGuire, listen to that song. <laughs> I've always liked that song, I don't know why. I get very excited about the day, days of destruction. Anyway, that's what we're here to prevent. And there's so many things we gotta do, and so much of it is local. Um, this whole matter of, of a global challenge, but local action required, it really is tying these two concepts together, and they both are crucial. Without these global commitments coming out of this conference, we're not, we have no chance of um, uh, changing the policies and the ways of life and the technologies so that human beings can coexist with all the other species. But if we don't act locally, uh, we miss quite a bit of the challenge. So there it is. Uh, we need reforestation in, in every area, wherever you can uh, capture carbon by increasing uh, vegetation. That's very important. And then, of course, the agriculture can be more efficient. We can use water more efficiently. Um, if we have more mass transit, we have less, more trains, uh, less uh, private vehicle trips. And it wouldn't take too much. If you get from 90% to 80%, that would be a major impact. So there's a lot that has to be done here uh, at the Paris Conference, COP21, and there's a lot we can do where, where we come from. And uh, that's why this under two MOU that now over 80 states, provinces, and regions have now signed is very important because we've got to uh, attack this problem at every level. And that's where research and science comes in because you know, despite all the research and the science, um, the governing majority in the United States Congress doesn't believe it. In fact, the head of the Environmental Committee is coming here. And when he gets off the plane, the first thing he's going to say, it's all a hoax. What the hell are you doing here? All for a hoax. Now, I hope he'll be greeted with uh, loud cries of execration, but, <laughs> or something like that. Um, because it's, there's a lot to know, and there's so many other things we gotta worry about. That climate change, well, we can maybe put that off, but you can't put it off too long because we don't know uh, enough to know when we've gone too far, when there's too much uh, carbon in the environment. We pass a tipping point, and then it can accelerate even more in a very nonlinear way. So. We have to be wary. The uh, two degrees centigrade, I think, still is only a 50% probability of stability. So that's why James Hansen and others say it should really be 1.5. We're not even on track to do the 2%, uh, the two degrees centigrade, rather. So there's a lot going on, um, and there's not one thing that's going to do it. It's all of this together. And uh, that's why I've, I'm. Uh, I'm very excited about this conference. It is probably the biggest thing for climate change uh, ever because the, the nation, they're all putting forward something and it's all gonna be clear what it is. And then right after uh, this Paris conference ends, uh, all the activists, uh, the sub-national jurisdictions can get going and keep pushing because this is something that we have to, it, the challenge, it's relentless and we can't grow tired, and all the things that we're talking about, um, we gotta understand them better. So we do need more science, maybe with less silos, and the world is, the world is not chopped up into, well, the world is in the academy chopped up into disciplines, but reality is not, it's rather arbitrary. So we do need the holistic sense. How do we see the, the community, uh, the environment, the ecology uh, in, in, the, in, in, a, in a way that's closer to the reality itself. And that requires new ways of thinking, a new sensitivity uh, to uh, 
what our lives are, are presented with and what our challenges are. So the fact that you're here, that's good, but it's just the beginning. This is gonna be a long slog to get to where we need to go. So don't work too hard, but keep it going. Because <laughs> we don't want you to get tired or get bored or get excited about something else. This is really a lifetime challenge and a task. And in that, uh, I join you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for I think we're done a sort of commission. Thank you very much indeed, Governor Brown. Um, inspiring and lessons from a place where things are really changing uh, and lessons from a place that is quite different to some of the places we talked about earlier in the afternoon, the cities of Southeast Asia and the cities of, of the Amazon countries. But nonetheless, a lot to be shared between those places, a lot of common problems. I guess it's hard for me to sum up what's been said this afternoon. I, I, it's always sort of boring to say we need more research, but there is so much research and there's so much we know, but there's such a lot we don't know as well, as Telma told us, even with the 15 kilograms of the fifth assessment report. And we still don't really know how all these bits fit together. We don't have the science of the systems. We don't know how to manage these high levels of complexity. Um, and I think we're going to have to learn to do that. I think the message from Governor Brown about you know, the next steps being at the sub-national jurisdictions, going back to what we've been calling landscapes, what people call other things, that's also a really important lesson. And we need in those places, we need citizen science. We need people who can learn and influence politicians and, uh, and convince those climate change skeptics and so forth and, and bring about good change. And maybe that grassroots global movement is is just as important as the, as the high level decisions that are going to be taken hopefully this week uh, by our delegates out in Le Bourget. Um, I think what's come out of this for me is a whole host of, of challenges and things that merit more, more research. We're here to talk about science, more science. I think that Robin's presentation sets out a huge range of, of possibilities, a very positive agenda of things that would merit investment in research and in action and, and doing things. I think that, that Eduardo has talked about all these institutional challenges, which we, I don't think it, they're broadly understood. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done to open people's minds to different sorts of institutional arrangements. But as you said, they're not going to be the same everywhere. They have to be a, f a product of the situation where they're going to operate. And I think it was really encouraging to hear from Telma that the next, the sixth assessment will embrace all the knowledge of people and indigenous people and, and citizen science and so forth and might even possibly include the word landscape a few times if, if some of the people in this room who are landscape enthusiasts can persuade that to happen. So I think at that point we have to conclude our meeting. I'd like to thank very much Governor Brown for gone again already, rushing across Paris <laughs> from his previous meeting, and I was told he had to go to another meeting immediately after this. Um, I'd thank him anyway, but particularly to thank Telma and Eduardo and Robin, who gave us really cutting me off presentations <laughs> on three dimensions of, of this huge problem and of the scientific challenges we face. So please join me in thanking our panelists very much for their contribution. Thank you very much. Before you leave, just a couple of remarks. Don't forget.